So, uh, welcome. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that it's not because we are rude or anything, but we can't see shit up here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we're getting blinded by the light up. Um, so, just if it seems like we are kind of watching different places, it's just due to that. Um, we have this talk about uh, building code and building websites for cloud and deploy. Um, and I think we should start about uh, introducing ourselves. Who are we? Um, I'm core team lead on the CMS. Um, I have been working with the cloud uh, system for a while, um, but mostly I do core stuff. Um, I help a lot on uh, many of the support cases, so I know quite a lot about what's actually going on with you guys uh, whenever you have problems in, in the cloud. Yeah, I am Kenneth. I am a cloud team lead. Um, I built some of the cloud, uh, not the infrastructure, but cloud services. Um, I also have been doing a lot of uh, second level support on the cloud cases, so um, I have somewhat of an idea of uh, the common pitfalls also. Yes, uh, the first thing we have is uh, thou shall not use NGIDs. Um, uh, there's a reason for that. Uh, do you have a clicker? I'm not sure if it's working. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Oh, so, the reason is that integer IDs should not be transferred as is. Uh, so, if you have an integer ID on your dev environment, for example, um, it could be integer like six, and when you transfer six through deploy or whatever uh, to your live environment, uh, it will still be six. However, the reference to six is not necessarily the same. The reference might on the dev environment be I don't know, like one page and page one, and and on the live environment IDs, ID number six could be page two. So uh, that's because of uh, the way Umbraco seven works. Um, it has uh, auto, auto incremented IDs, uh, and these IDs are um, well, you shouldn't transfer them. You should use goods instead. The goods can be found in the info tab, um, and uh, yeah, use those. Those are globally unique, and they will be the same on all environments. So there are maybe some reasons that you can't use GUIDs. Uh, you may be suffering from long-term legacy code, uh, like, well, you are depending on, or you're depending on a third-party package, for example, uh, that uses that needed to use uh, NGID IDs. So what you're going to do is you're going to build deploy connectors. So you can use uh, your own connector uh, in deploy. Yep. So basically, we kind of know we have the problem of integer ICs not being, really being compatible between environments, so we had to figure out a solution, and that is the deploy connectors. The purpose of a connector um, is simply to help deploy process your data. Um, it's actually pretty simple. Um, I'll just show you a quick um, demo here. Um, let me see if you can actually see this. A deploy connector is a little bunch of code, uh, but there's two important things. Um, we have something called an artifact, which is basically what we transfer between two sites in, in a cloud setup. Um, for us to actually handle your custom data, um, we need to know what is it. What is it. Um, otherwise, it will just be transferred as it is, for example, as an integer. Um, we have this thing called a connector which has a method called to artifact. It basically lets us know how to handle, how to actually read your data and, and make something uh, use, useful out of it. Um, in this case, it's a media, con it media picker value connector. Um, it basically tells us that this connector, uh, this, uh, this property type is storing the data in one way, and you need to sort of do these things to make it something that is um, transferable. Um, then it has this other method called um, from artifact that basically does the opposite thing, takes this uh, serialized thing and turns it into something that Umbraco and the destination can actually use. Um, so basically, these connectors is what deploy consists of. Um, it's completely extendable, which means that you can, for your own custom data and your own custom packages, can you actually do these connectors to make sure that they're compatible with cloud. And that's one of the key things we want to touch upon. If you do custom stuff in your sites uh, and they have to be working on cloud, you really have to think about 
is this data actually compatible if I transfer it to another site? If it's not, you should really look into making a connector for your data. Then it will actually work um, across all your environments. Um, yeah. So. <laughs> Uh, how do we do this? Back to the presentation. And I lost my notes. <laughs> I think there's some improvements to be made to this Google slide thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Apart from doing your own connectors, uh, there's also a community of people doing connectors for the most common packages. Um, we've decided to actually collect these things into one separate repository, uh, which means that a lot of people can actually contribute to these things, can help fix bugs, uh, the code is available to everyone. Um, and as a plus, we also actually deploy this country uh, repository, uh, sorry, this country uh, DLL, we've applied to all cloud sites. So if you do a very popular package, such as Warto, for example, or nested content, stack content, um, you will actually put your connector into this repository and it will automatically get deployed to all cloud sites. So people can just use it without having to actually know about these things. Um, so this is also a really good place to go to, to find uh, inspiration of doing your own connectors and find examples of how to do it. Um, I would really encourage you to go to that one. Yes. Yes. So, uh, one of the things we see most when uh, doing support um, is that the most uh, issues occur when people are not following the correct workflow. And in cloud, we have uh, one relatively simple room, rule. It is that workflow is important, yo, and uh, always follow the left from right to right workflow. So as you can see right here, um, we have the local to dev to staging to live. If you follow that workflow, you're usually in the green zone. Um, uh, we, don't we don't see too many problems uh, when following this workflow. Most of it, we have a lot of issues occurring when people, uh, when people happen to edit an, a template or a document type or on the live environment and then they recreate it somewhere else, but we'll get to that later. And also, having to clean up after uh, a bad workflow uh, is no fun at all. Um, you will basically have to backtrack whatever you did. So, um, we also have um, a file system here. Uh, and in the file system, you can create your own files, but they are not actually committed to the repository. Um, uh, templates and embargo pack packages are handled by Deploy, though, which means they are automatically added to the repository. I think I have a demo right now. Because uh, I will show you how nasty the workflow can be in order to actually make stuff work. Um, what am I doing? How do you get this? There's the kudu. Yep. So. If I go into my site here, um, and let's see, I want to create, uh, I want to create a new file, like uh, um, come on, So, I should now have a demo.txt file, it's right there. So, I want to add it to my repository. So, I have to manually copy it. Uh, sorry, um, I can just do that. Uh, de demo. The thing uh, you need to realize here is that uh, yeah. the site that is actually running in your cloud site uh, is completely separated from the repository. So, basically, whatever you do in your file system for your site, is not necessarily reflected in the repository. Um, that's a pretty common mistake that people think they can just update files and they will always be persisted. But the next time you're doing a deployment, you will actually have your files overridden by what is in your repository. So it's it's a really uh, it's a really common issue we're seeing that that people don't really realize how the setup of of these things are. Um, 
So what Kenneth is doing here, he's basically copying the file from the running site into the repository uh, folder. Um, yeah. So now we have it here in the repository folder. Uh, so what you can see is, right, if I do a git status, I have git here. Um, I have the demo text, it hasn't been added, let's just add it. Right, and oh, that's not how I spell it. Right, so what you can see now is that my repository is, if you go status, it's in a good state right now. Oh, I can't spell. It's awesome. Yeah. So this is actually the workflow needed to add a file. So you shouldn't do that. You should always, always use the correct workflow. I'm trying to get back to this class. So, um, but as you can see, we're using Git on cloud. Uh, however, we are not using it for versioning. Um, we are using it to, uh, we're using the, uh, the Git merge rules, and we, ha uh, and we, we are using uh, change origins. So you can see up here, you have your local, and dev is upstream to local, uh, staging again is upstream to live, oh, sorry, to, to dev, and live is upstream to staging. So when you're pushing, you're actually pushing from environment to environment to environment. And that's how we use Git in cloud. Uh, fortunately, we do a pull before we push. So you could also, uh, once you have your, uh, your file in the repository, it would be, you could, you would have to do like two <laughs> deployments in order to get it pulled if you didn't do your manual Git work. Uh, and it would just be a hassle. Um, so use the, use the right uh, workflow because there's a lot of, you can end up in, in a state where you have to do a lot of manual work in order to get back on track. So, yes, we use it for transferring schem schemas. Uh, when you ha are in your uh, local environment, uh, we transfer, we have deploy generate um, UDA files off of, um, what do you call the, well, off of our uh, <laughs> artifacts. Artifacts, yeah, that's the word. Um, and the artifacts are uh, doc types and uh, file types, sorry, not file types. Um, doc types, types, data types. Uh, data types, uh, yeah, all these exactly. Things. All of these um, metadata stuff. Uh, we use Git for the merge, lo merge logic, uh, so we don't need to override. Uh, if we encounter a conflict in, uh, we will overwrite instead of resolving because we have a, a firm belief that the, um, that the pushing environment is the one who knows what's right. Um, and this is, uh, this is where me, me, most people get in trouble uh, if they don't realize that this, this is how it works. Um, I'm, not gonna, I'm not saying there's a huge risk to doing this, um, but it's minimal, but it's still very real in, in the case that you can, if you use the wrong workflow, you can lose work. So the, the key takeaway here is if you yeah. don't follow the workflow, you might end up with conflicts. And if you do, uh, we will always override your stuff with what exactly. you're deploying. And exactly. that can end up in some really bad cases. So it's again, try to follow the correct workflow. And if you don't follow the correct workflow, you need to do these manual steps that can it just show you yeah. to sort of put your environment in a correct state so you don't end up with these things happening. Thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, that was actually the, what I just showed you was uh, what we do in order to get our, if we have a new file on, and we did it in the wrong, uh, wrong workflow, um, on one single environment, I'll show you something about, a little about um, pushing from environments to environments. Um, I won't do a demo. Uh, so, as I told you before, uh, if a change causes a conflict, the deployer wins. 
Um, and that also goes for templates. Um, yeah, there's not a lot more to it. Yeah. Um, configurations. Shared configurations are can be a problem uh, because if everybody shares, in, as I showed you before, since they're all upstreams, they're basically the same, so they have the same repo. Uh, and that means that, uh, yeah, uh, you, if you have one file, it will be the same file over f uh, more environments. Uh, so when we say everything is synced, everything really is synced. We don't, we're not having any differences except for, um, well, I'll get to that later. Um, and you can't, when, when you have one, you have one, let's go with the web config file. Uh, you have one file and all your configurations will be the same because it's the same file, so yeah. Um, but then in enters <laughs> the config transforms. Config transforms, uh, they allow you to modify a file. Um, basically you can, uh, you can take your, conf uh, your transform and they will be applied for every environment. So you can have a, an, a transform for live and, and staging and dev. Um, wow. <laughs> okay. And I will show you a config transform. So uh, yesterday I uh, created a pretty basic uh, transform to the web config here. Um, what we have here is basically um, a transform to the uh, to the development environment. I don't know. Can you see? Are you, uh, are you able to see what I'm? I can zoom a bit. Uh, it's not really important what's in the file. Uh, what is, is important, however, is the file structure. Um, so it's structured with name, environment, xdt, dot transform, um, dot config. I think there's a dot config there as well. Uh, yeah, I don't know what happened there. <laughs> uh, this is the right one, though. Uh, uh, another common error we are uh, experiencing on cloud is rewrite rules. Rewrite rules are the source of all of our issues in HQ, basically, um, because rewrite rules can be very, very hard, um, and so many things can go wrong. They can be too greedy, um, basically meaning that you are you're going to experience them covering a lot more uh, URLs that you want them to uh, to cover. Uh, they can uh, take over uh, deploy and Umbraco endpoints, so your back office will stop working and your deployments will stop working. Uh, I've seen that like a lot of times. Uh, it's so many times, so it's actually the first thing, thing we check when, uh, when we have a, a case on, on support. Um, HTTP and HTTPS uh, redirecting to the front page is another common error we were experiencing. Um, HTTPS, uh, when you have, if you have, if you enter a site, like you go in like, uh, I don't know, uh, usite.com slash en slash whatever, and then it redirects, when you go in with it via HTTP and you want an HTTPS redirect, you re so you redirect it to the .com domain uh, instead, and that really, really, really breaks a lot of stu stuff in, uh, in Umbraco, or at least on cloud. Uh, uh, when you do that, um, the host, host name uh, redirects, they break latchability. Uh, do you guys know what latch is? All right, so you don't, you're not going to be able to get a certificate because the external service we have validating the, uh, the endpoint uh, are not able to reach that endpoint because they're redirected. They are asking on the HTTP. Uh, and when they're redirected to the front page, uh, they'll get a they'll get a completely different response than, uh, than expected, and then you will be in a bad state where you're not able to get a certificate. Um, and in general, regex can be hard. 
Um, regular expressions are hard to read, and uh, people say when you've uh, once you've written the uh, the, uh, the regular expression, you uh, you can forget all about reading it again. It will be it, you'll never get it. I, I have it the same way. I don't. Uh, I'm not a, a fan. Um, you should always test your rewrite rules extensively with all components, uh, at least in the back office and, well, all your components in, in Umbraco and, and your site, because um, they can be very, very, very hard uh, to, to figure out all the edge cases. And again, when testing on local or wherever, don't forget to test HTTPS as well. Um, again, this is one of the main things we see in uh, in cloud. Yep. So um, one of the most common errors we see with uh, cloud is uh, duplicated things. Um, it is really annoying uh, to actually experience this, and it's also really, really annoying to fix it. And sometimes it's even impossible to actually fix it in a correct way. Um, so one of the key things that uh, I would like to uh, talk about is the duplicated document types. Um, it usually happens because developers think that document types are a little bit more simple than they actually are. It's just a defini definition of your documents, and, and I mean, why shouldn't I be able to just recreate this thing in my other environments, and then it should just work? The fact is that um, it's not just a description. There's a whole lot more inside a doc type that actually kind of connects it to the same doc type in different environments. So. Um, in deploy and in cloud, they are completely uh, th considered completely different entities. Um, so to actually make sure that these things stay connected and your documents based on these things are actually still connected and transferable, you should always make sure to deploy your changes instead of just recreating them. Um, you might end up with a site where something seems broken and you don't really know how to fix it, and the obvious easy way is to just go in and modify your things to make them look the same, but it's, it's really not the same. Um, so if you need to do stuff like this, you basically have two options. Uh, you either completely recreate these things, uh, but if you do this, really make sure that you delete everything in your destination, because otherwise you will end up with duplicates. Um, the most, the best way to actually do these things is to always make sure to update your existing things, and if you're experiencing errors, fix these errors instead of actually trying to hack your way around them. Uh, it's, it's not really a good idea. Um, it usually ends up with me in support, sitting, doing manual database stuff, and I really don't like that. <laughs> um, in the duplicated things, we also have duplicated properties. It's actually pretty much the same as the duplicated document types. Um, it also just applies to properties. Um, it might seem like a good idea that if you have something you just uh, add on a document type, for example, a property called uh, title, uh, then you try to deploy this to your other environment, and you figure out something is wrong, it won't deploy it, so I'm just going to recreate the one called title on the other environment. Basically the same thing, it's not the same property, we can't really make these things work, we end up with duplicate properties and a messed up database, and, and it's, it's not really a good thing. So yeah, never recreate manually, always deploy your things. That's kind of the key takeaway to avoiding <laughs> duplicate things. Uh, and if you do end up with duplicate things, try to fix them. If you don't know how to fix them, reach out to support. They can usually help with some guidelines on how to fix these things, because it can go really wrong if you don't do it the right way. Uh, so make sure to reach out to support if you're in, in doubt. So on deleting doc types, um, we often get a support ticket saying, it seems like there's a bug. I deleted my doc type, I deployed my changes. It's, it's still there. I don't really see What's going on? Why, why isn't it deleted? I, I did it and I deployed it. I would expect it to be deleted. Um, I'm going to show you a little demo here. Um, the thing is, if you have a site here, let me just sign in. This is a very simple site, one doc type and uh, one document. If I check the database for this thing, um, it's going to show me I should just share that one. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's going to show me that you have one document in the database, and it basically has some properties. Um, what you saw was that my site contained just one property. But I have several versions of this thing because I saved it a bunch of times. Um, so these are actually the version properties of my site. Um, the thing is, if I go to my site now 
and just do what I would expect that deploy was doing. Basically take my document type and say delete. And it's gonna tell me that everything will be deleted. I click okay. And wait a little bit. What you will see in here is that everything is gone. And it's it's like really, really gone. Um, we got that warning in the UI, um, but what we can't do with deploy is give you warnings due to whatever we are trying to do. So we kind of had a discussion on whether it's a good idea to actually delete things automatically based on your deployments, and we came up with a solution that, no, it really isn't. Um, we would really hate to just delete a bunch of your content with no way of going back through history by automation. Um, so we figured out that it's actually a better solution that if you have to do deletes, you have to manually go in and explicitly delete your things. Um, it seems like it's the best approach, at least, to avoid too many problems. So what many people consider as a, as a bug is, is not really um, something we claim as a bug. Um, yeah. Uh, let me just hang on. So yeah, the result of deleting a doc type is all documents are gone, all properties are gone, all revisions of this is gone. It's really gone. Um, <laughs> and no, we don't really want to automate this. Then there's another one that we get at quite often. Um, my members are not syncing um, between my environments. And this is also one of the ones that we have been discussing a lot. Should members actually sync between your environments? We came up with a bunch of cases that made a pro for doing this, but we also came up with a lot of cons for doing it. Um, it is as it is now, per design, um, because we've considered that ch moving around members between your environments is not very GDPR compliant. You will definitely have uh, live customer data in your live site. Uh, do you really want this data to be automatically deployed down to your development sites and staging sites and even your developers' own computers? It's, it would be a nightmare to actually maintain some sort of GDPR compliance with this. Um, so we decided that for now, it's not really a good idea. Um, apart from that, uh, members uh, on a live site usually ends up being a huge amount of data. Um, it's, it's not really a problem when you're testing stuff on your staging environment, you have a couple of members to test things, maybe even 100 members. But when you actually go live, you, you usually end up with maybe 100,000 of members. And that's a lot of data that you don't really want to be putting in your dev environments and on your developers' computers. Uh, so that's another kind of actually um, making sure these things transfer. Apart from that, we thought about doing some sort of selective restore to avoid having so many members. But there's really no, <coughs> there's really no good way to actually pick a specific amount of members out of 100,000 members. So we couldn't really come up with any options for this one. So it really is per design that members are not transferable. So, when working with members, there's a few things you should, should know. Um, first thing is that references, of course, will at some point be broken if you do references to members. Uh, you should always keep this in mind when you're actually doing code that uses members. If you do a reference to something, you need to make sure that the case of having a null member will happen. Uh, so, yeah, code with this in, in mind. Um, then there's the fact that syncing will if you need to do this, be a manual job or script. Uh, it's perfectly possible to actually do it. It's just database migration yeah. stuff, uh, syncing stuff. Um, but it is definitely a manual job for you to do. It's not something we will be handling um, as it is. And if you actually decide to do this, please make sure to anonymize all your data. Um, GDPR, again, um, it's just a really bad idea to have all this data lying around and having to do policies for knowing where this data actually lives whenever you have to clean it up. Yes, um, then we have a few things. Yeah. Um, can I have the clicker? Yes. Thank you. Uh, the things we covered so far are, um, are usually because of lack of knowledge. Uh, however, as the title suggests, we are only feeble humans, uh, which means we also have some known issues. Um, these are things that um, that we are, we know of, uh, some of them we try to fix, but uh, we have, uh, we also have workarounds for, 
most of them, at least the ones we'll show you now. Yep. So the first one we can talk about is what we call the allowed child doc types issue. Um, it usually shows up as a problem with allowed doc types whenever you're trying to deploy something, um, but it actually kind of uh, originates somewhere else. Uh, in Umbraco, we only store references as one-way references, uh, which means that whenever you are picking a media item on a content item, we store the reference on the content item that it has a media item picked. There is no really, not really a good way to actually go the other way around it's from the media item and see where it's used. Um, Yes, references go from source to destination. This also means that if you actually have a reference and you delete the destination, we have no way of knowing what to update to actually update this connection that no longer exists or should exist. Um, it will definitely cause a lot of broken connections and broken dependencies, um, which is something we are kind of having a hard time handling. Um, it's very hard for us to fix it in code because we don't really know if this is really something that should be broken or if it's something that is broken. Um, so it's, it's hard to fix for us without having to either break functionality, meaning that we can't really uh, look up references, um, or we otherwise have to pass through all the content to actually see if anything is references this on deletes, and that is just a very bad solution. So we're looking forward to having two ray references in Umbraco at some point because we can actually use those to prevent these errors from happening. Um, the workaround for this, fortunately, is fairly easy. Um, it involves you opening up the doc type, for example, in the uh, editor. Um, when we actually load up the doc type in the UI, um, that broken reference will not be loaded because it doesn't exist anymore. So resaving the document type will actually save it in a correct state. Um, so there's fortunately a pretty easy workaround for this. Um, and this is why we haven't considered sort of trying to fix it yet. So failing deployments, um, when, uh, when a f uh, pl deployment fails, um, you should always check the portal because the portal highlights all your deployment errors. Um, it's usually there in a big red um, like dot <laughs> that says you, you have uh, extraction errors or, or whatever. You can usually use that to either deduct um, uh, what's gone wrong, or you can uh, use it to at least contact support. Um, so, and uh, when you push local to cloud, uh, you do it through Git. Um, and you should again always check the portal. Um, when you have a broken environment, um, that's when extractions fail. You should again check the portal. Uh, and don't continue to work with it, because even though it might work, uh, it might be in a state that you don't realize that it's in. Um, it's, it's completely plausible that your deployment has gone wrong because the system tells you it's wrong, uh, but you can't really see it at first uh, because it, it can exist on, in like a database level that's not really obvious right away. And in the long run, it, uh, you can end up uh, having to recreate a lot of data. Um, and you should never recreate missing parts uh, manually, like Klaus told you earlier. Uh, uh, do duplicating document types and properties is never a great idea. Uh, you should always follow the, wor uh, the, the workflow and you should backtrack your steps. Clean up the mess. Um, and you should follow the, the proper procedures. Uh, uh, yeah, and support is there. The proper procedures is basically backtracking your steps. So when you have something that's broken, unbreak it. And that's simple for me to see, but to say, but it's also there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, scenarios that you can get in um, that are very different and that has different solutions. Usually, you would go about just if you have uh, when you have broken, uh, 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 which you have du duplicate properties, you need to roll them back by deleting, and then you can push the old ones, and it's, it's a horrible mess, but you will, get, you will eventually get there, and support is there to help you figure it out. Yep, so the last thing I'll talk about is Umbrago Forms, and I would like to first ask how many have actually used Umbrago Forms on cloud? <laughs> a 
that's a lot. How many have had issues when using Humbago Forms on Cloud? Yes, I was expecting that. It is, um, <laughs> it is a problem, and the, the problem mainly consists about the fact that the concept was broken. Um, someone at some point did something wrong uh, in general in regards to forms. Um, the thing is, we consider forms definitions as sort of document types for uh, form entries. Um, you can kind of say that these things are the same. You define a document type or you define a forms definition. Uh, in forms, you have entries that fits into these descriptions, and in document types, you have documents that fit in. So it would make total sense that, of course, the, these forms definitions should also be transferred as document types. That's very obvious. Um, and that also means that they will be deployed by the portal, um, and it all works. We tested it. It works perfect. It works just as expected. Uh, we are forcing the left-to-right workflow for forms, um, like everything else, and all is good. Um, problem, however, is that editors are not really uh, developers. So they are not developing things on dev and staging. They are doing it directly on live, which is the one they have access to. Um, this is a really big problem, because that kind of not that doesn't, it simply just doesn't work with the left to right workflow. Uh, you are doing directly what we're saying we don't want you to be, do, to be doing. So um, this has been broken for quite a while and we've had many, many workarounds such as copying your things manually from your live site to your dev site, committing them and then kind of avoiding the issue but not really fixing the issue as such. So we decided recently that uh, we need to fix it and now the concept was fixed. <laughs> Um, we haven't deployed this yet, um, but we are still like, re reviewing the code, but it will be out pretty soon. Forms definitions will now be considered as content instead of actual structured deployments. Um, it means that whenever you're doing a, a, a change to a form, it will not show up as a change that needs to be deployed through the portal. Um, it will be something you will have to manually transfer, just like you do with content uh, by the back office. Um, yes, transferred and deployed by the back office, like the normal process of transferring documents uh, and similar things. Um, it no longer forces the left to right workflow, which is good. Uh, it means you can actually decide when you want things to deploy and what you want to deploy. Uh, and your editors can actually safely now delete, uh, sorry, edit things on live without you overriding your changes whenever you deploy something from your development environment. So we're really hoping that this will fix many of the issues you guys have been having with this, because it's, it's been a pain to work with, honestly. Um, the key thing about this is you have full control over transfers. You have to manually transfer things, unfortunately. Um, sorry, um, have to manually transfer things, but at, in, like the upside of this is that you actually know what's going on. Um, you don't en end up with things being deployed by accident or whatever. Uh, you, however, also need to consider the fact that since these things are no longer handled automatically, you do need to transfer your forms manually uh, if they're not connected by dependencies. The connectors we have for form pickers and all that stuff and forms used inside content will, of course, work, so you should usually not see this as a problem. But if you, for example, have a reference directly to a template by its uh, GUID in some sort of... Um, in a template to a form, um, we cannot really pick up that sort of dependency. So in those cases, you would need to manually deploy your forms to actually make sure that they end up on your expected environments. Um, but we think this will hopefully remove many of the issues you've been having with forms. Yes, I think that was pretty much what we want to cover. And yeah. we have a bit of time for some questions, um, so feel free. Regarding the fixed forms, will the same thing be possible or considered for dictionaries? Yes, we are actually looking to that. Um, we have some code ready for it, but it hasn't been priority yet. Uh, we thought that forms was actually affecting more people. Uh, and the thing is, dictionary, yes, it's a problem, but we fortunately don't see it that often compared to how often we see the forms one. So we prioritize that one first, but definitely we will be doing dictionaries. It's the same issue that people are editing dictionary items on other environments than the one we sort of expected it to be, which makes sense. Um, and they should really not be deployed as a structure. So, yep. Uh, you mentioned one-way dependencies uh, for content and media. So yep. an example would be we push a cloud to staging and the uh, editor starts adding content. And if I want to fix something locally, I try to restore and I get an error saying, saying that entity with this UID uh, is missing a dependency with this UID. And obviously, uh, 
there isn't an easy way that I can think of to find the node which is actually meant to be uh, an issue. Uh, can you add or can you tell me another way to find them? Well, <laughs> there's not really a, a good way to always find things. Um, I would say that if you do know the probably the GUID of the thing that is referenced, uh, look it up in the Umbraco node table of the site that actually made the reference and try to figure out if you can somehow f uh, find the, uh, the link that you're missing. Um, there's not really a good way to do this, uh, like otherwise, uh, other than manual work, unfortunately. So, uh, would it be not possible uh, to add the ID that is affected essentially after the ID? Because then you can use the query string to actually navigate to that node and then at least to find out which, what is the name and then find it on your lo local or live environment? Yeah, so basically what you're saying is to include the ID yeah. on of the source, yeah. Um, yeah or the, the, the dependency which is missing, because most of the times it's a um, image which is in recycle bin and I can't restore the content yeah. while having, having to go and guessing and republishing them all. The thing is, right now we don't really have any possibility of storing the ID on the artifact. Uh, we only have goods as a sort of identifier on artifacts. Um, it could be something we could look into. It is something we're looking into. Um, and we are working on getting the error messages better on, on uh, deploy in general. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah we, we kind of do a lot of work on, on trying to help people actually fix the problems um, because sometimes it's, it's easier to take that approach instead of actually fixing the problem to begin with. Um, you mentioned the updating of the forms uh, uh, flow. Um, yep. Is there a timeline for it, and what is the the, the best practice to get uh, the forms uh, get to deploy when you know the forms are changed on live? Because now there is not not a preferred way, I think. So, I think um, right now the code is being reviewed. It might actually be reviewed, uh, be finished review yet, uh, and mm -hmm. actually is merged. Yeah. I think. So it's just a matter of time before it's deployed to cloud. Uh, we couldn't deploy it right before CodeGuard because... Yeah, we're not going to do that. No. <laughs> um, but I think it'll be out right after CodeGuard, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Um, if not Tuesday, then, well, very soon. Yeah. So within the next month at, l yeah. uh, at most. Uh, probably within What the is the best week. way to, to work yes. around it for now? Because uh, The best way right now is that um, whenever you're saving something on live, it will get uh, automate, uh, automatically generated this uh, UDA file in your data folder of your site. Uh, so what you need to do to actually work around this is to manually copy this one to your staging and demo sites so it's in sync and committed to Git with the way that Kenneth showed you. Basically, yeah, basically what I showed you. Yeah, you uh, can. You so can. So uh, I, I, it, it is safe if I copy all the UDA, UDA files from Live and put them in my dev development environment and then push them on to Live again. Well, all the, all the sorry, all the forms uh, UDA files because yes, the rest is, I would yeah. say technically yeah. yes, it's safe to do that. Uh, I would only take the, the forms files uh, if it was. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that's yeah. what I mean because <laughs> I don't know which form they yeah. edited, so I need the latest version yeah, of everything. Exactly. Um, what I would do is basically have a if it's something you do often, clone a copy of your live site Git repository. It's available in the portal uh, to your local machine in some weird folder you have somewhere. Uh, once in a while, do a pool, see what which files were updated. Do the same for your dev and staging environments and just manually copy over the forms files uh, based on what date they have. Uh, they should retain the, the date stamp, I think, through Git. Uh, and then just do a commit. Uh, and fortunately, it works with the same Git repository across all your environments. So basically, these commits should be compatible. Uh, it will know that it shouldn't recreate and delete all that stuff. Um, and you should also hopefully avoid merge conflicts by doing the separate commits. I think we should kick it up a notch and add five developers to the solution and then we should make some uh, fast commits to the, uh, the dev environment. Mm -hmm. And when the dev environment then has a green dot, I mean, you mentioned the red dot and the green dot, yeah. still has a green dot, but no document types is updated or anything. You're just looking at a site that is not updating itself yep. and you have to go manually do a deploy on that environment. What is actually going on? 
That's a really good question. <laughs> um, I've been wondering the same thing, and I often have to talk to our DevOps people to actually figure out what is going on. We have one of them right there standing. <laughs> Okay. Um, but the thing is, uh, apparently the state of the environment is not really just a one place thing. It's actually consisting of a few different checks that kind of puts the state together. So unfortunately we don't have one place to look for a specific error if an error is happening. And for some reason sometimes it also seems like these errors are not really getting picked up, which means it will like green even though something actually wasn't green. Um, what I usually do is go to the site, go to the uh, deploy data folder, uh, it's just called slash data, uh, and check that one to see if there's a marker file in there. The marker file is basically what we use to communicate from the Umbraco site to cloud um, and the other way around. So whenever we want a deployment to happen, we put in a deploy file, it's just a file called deploy, and deploy will pick this up and do the uh, deployment. If something fails, you will see a deploy dash failed file in there and I mean, check the content of that file, it usually contains an error on what happened. Um, that's usually the case whenever it lights green, you will see that there's a failed marker there. So I would say check out that folder if, if you have these problems. Um, it's something we are also working on fixing. Yeah. I mean, it's part of the error reporting thing. Why would I not see any errors if I have an error? Um, we still really haven't figured out and it's it's not quite consistently happening. So yeah. it's kind of hard for us to debug it, otherwise um, we would have done it so far. It's really hard to replicate. Yeah. Um, well, at least consistently. But we do know that it, it happens because, I mean, I've seen it as well, so it's not something we are disregarding completely, but it's just hard to replicate it. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Does the roadmap um, contain a plan for versioning and Git flow? Mm. No, uh, when you say versioning, do you mean uh, no? Um, well, uh, no, not right now. <laughs> <laughs> we have um, some. We have, have a lot of different thoughts on how this could be done. Yeah. Uh, right now, there's not really a good way to do versioning because there's a whole lot of stuff involved. It's both file systems, database, and everything that needs to be versioned. Yeah. Um, I think the solution we've talked about so far that might get closest to some sort of versioning um, is that we want to support people doing temporary environments uh, that they want for some specific feature to test it out and see if it works. Um, what we consider is that you will be able to, at some point, create a a branch that you know from the beginning will be killed at some point. So it's basically just a test branch. Um, it means that we won't have to handle like, all the stuff with merging things back in, um, but it also gives you the option of actually having a separate test environment, uh, not necessarily in your normal flow. We are still not sure what the solution will be and if this would be one of them, but it's, it's definitely one of the options we're considering because we know there's a, there's a need and a re there are a lot of people requesting that they are able to actually branch out things because it, it is good, <laughs> um, you should be able to branch out things, but there's just a whole lot of things making it more complicated than, than just the Git part, yeah. unfortunately. We would basically have to write Git for databases, and right now we're not going into that. Oh, your computer died. Um, Um, we've seen some issues with uh, media, uh, especially images. If uh, like there's some kind of limit on uh, file name length on Azure, I think it's 80 characters or something like that. Uh, yeah. And also special characters, like if the client has used some kind of trademark symbol or something oh. like that. And Umbraco actually allows to upload it but uh, we then run into some problems when trying to deploy it from uh, between environments. I, yep. Is there somehow or some way that we can make sure that if the client could upload it, then it can be deployed? Well, there's, uh, there's a whole bunch of things in this one. Um, I was working with it probably like a couple of years ago, uh, and the main issue is that um, we don't really know what the limit is, and somehow this limit can kind of vary once in a while. Um, I've had, during the testing, uh, at some point I was not even able to upload a file with five characters in the file name. Um, 
and sometimes it will just work with 20 characters and sometimes even more. It seems like there are some issues with the Windows file system that kind of is a little bit quirky. And we tried to do a lot of workarounds, uh, such as doing a, a, a different implementation of the uh, .NET file system providers. Uh, doesn't really work either, um, but it's definitely one of the issues we're having. We've kind of worked a little bit around it in our new uh, stamp, which Jorgen has been doing, uh, by changing some of the structure of how, your, uh, how our sites are actually stored on the file system. Uh, before we had a lot of goods to even, I mean, the entire path of a site consisted of goods for the project, goods for the environments, and all that stuff. We kind of tried to put this in another way on the file system to actually limit, because it's basically the entire file system path that, that limits this uh, amount of characters. Um, so we've tried to do some workarounds to actually make it possible to use longer paths, but we are not quite there yet. Um, but it's definitely something we are looking into, because it is causing issues. Sure. So sometimes the repo that cloud provides can be quite slow. Will there ever be an option to bring my own repo and have that used as the deployment repo so cloud can talk to a, a GitHub repo, for example? That is, um, that is uh, really an infrastructure question. It's about um, the current infrastructure we have now, now doesn't support it. Um, we are looking into new infrastructures, of course, we always are. Um, and we are also looking into infrastructures that will support this. So, now, no for now, yes, maybe in the future. It is uh, one of the features we will need for some other projects we have in the timeline. <laughs> so I think it's definitely something that will get some priority on, on trying to make it happen, yeah. if possible. I think that was it. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks. Thank you.